Okay, welcome. So today we're going to be talking about Thomas Hobbes and this book that he wrote, uh, The Leviathan. Uh, but we're just going to be looking at a small section of Hobbes and the Leviathan, the excerpt found in this textbook, Living Ethics by Russ Schaefer Landau. So, uh, this is perhaps uh, the most well-known part of Hobbes's Leviathan, uh, and it's so well-known because it's really the basis of modern social contract theory. Uh, so, here are the six things you need to know about Hobbes and the Leviathan. First, Hobbes introduces us to this idea of the state of nature. He doesn't actually use uh, the phrase the state of nature in this book. That actually comes later in other writers like Locke. Uh, but he certainly has the idea of the state of nature. And the idea in the state of nature is that for Hobbes, there, nothing is unjust and everything is legal. So basically, the state of nature is a place where there are no rules, and Hobbes thinks that that's a really bad thing. Uh, so here's how he puts it. It's manifest that during the time men live without a common power, that's another way of basically saying the law, uh, that keeps them all in awe, afraid, uh, they are in that condition which is called war. So that's what he means. That's the word that he uses for the state of nature in the Leviathan, the state of war. And such a war as is of every man against every man. So where there is no law, we are all fighting each other. He goes on to say on the same page, in such a condition, there is no place for industry because the fruit thereof is uncertain and consequently no culture of the earth, he goes on, no society, and which is worst of all, continual fear and danger of violent death. And the life of man in the state of nature, the state of war, uh, your life is solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. Uh, this is one of Hobbes's most famous quotations, the idea that the life without law in the state of nature is nasty, brutish, and short. He goes on to say, to this war of every man against every man, this is also consequent that nothing can be unjust. So if everybody is out to get you and there's nothing constraining them from doing so, it doesn't make sense to say that anything is just or unjust. He goes on to say, the notions of right and wrong, justice and injustice have no place. Where there is no common power, there is no law. Where no law, no injustice. Force and fraud in the state of war, in the state of nature, are the two cardinal virtues. Uh, so basically, lying, cheating, and uh, force, we can't say stealing because there is no such thing as stealing in the state of nature, because nothing is anybody's property, right? But Hobbes is saying that there is no such thing as justice or injustice uh, when everybody is out to get everybody else, as it were. If there is no law, nothing is illegal, and if nothing is legal or illegal, nothing is just or unjust. Now, many philosophers would go ahead and disagree with this claim. Uh, so, for instance, if you thought that acting justly was acting in accord with human nature and human desires, well, that would actually be possible to do in the state of nature. But that's not how Hobbes thinks about it. He says, where there is no law, there is no injustice. So, in the state of nature, Everything is legal, but that's horrible, right? That's where your life is nasty, brutish, and short. He also points out 
that he thinks it's foolish to act cooperatively with others if you have no reason to think that they will cooperate. That really ties into our last point that in the state of nature, force and fraud are the two cardinal virtues. Virtues. So here he says, look, if you're making a covenant, covenant just means a contract to do something in the future. He says, if a covenant be made wherein neither of the parties perform presently but trust one another, that's, you know, to act in the future, in the condition of mere nature, which is a condition of war of every man against every man, upon any reasonable suspicion, the covenant is void. But if there be a common power set over them both, with right and force sufficient to compel performance, it is not void. So Hobbes' thought is like, look, uh, you don't want to be made a sucker. You don't want others to exploit you. But within that context, that means that you don't have a valid contract for future action from someone if you don't have any reason to believe that they're going to follow through on their part. So Hobbes says that it's going to be foolish to act cooperatively if you know that others are going to cheat you, you know, use the methods of force and fraud from the state of nature. But he goes on to say that if there is force sufficient to compel performance, then it's not void. So here's the thought. If you are more likely to suffer uh, by not acting in accord with your covenants, well, that's going to give the other party to that covenant a reason to believe that you're going to do your part. And this is basically Hobbes' argument for Big Brother, why we need government. He says, it's the job of the government to act as the enforcer of covenants uh, between citizens. And once we have that uh, force sufficient to compel performance, uh, then we have non-void covenants, that is, valid covenants. But if we don't have that sufficient force, then you have no reason to do your part in the covenant. You're just opening yourself up to exploitation that way, says Hobbes. So this might seem to be like a pretty dismal situation. How do we get from having no government to having a government? How do we get out of this terrible state of nature? Well, Hobbes says that, thankfully, we possess capacity for reason. Now, reason for Hobbes is all about fitting your means to your ends, right? Get the things that you need in order to satisfy your desires. For instance, if you want to get somewhere in your car, you'd be reasonable to put gas in your tank, right? Well, this capacity for reason, our ability to use thought to fit our means to our ends, Hobbes thinks that's going to lead us to give up our right to all things. So earlier we noticed that you have the right to do anything in the state of nature because nothing is unjust and everything is illegal. Or everything is legal, nothing is illegal in the state of nature. Uh, but Hobbes suggests that these laws of nature, which are just general rules that you discover using reason, right? you find that you've got to do uh, the things that preserve your life. You're forbidden to do that which is destructive to your life or which take away your means of preserving your life. So from this, he says, it's a precept or a general rule of reason that every man ought to endeavor peace. Right? We all ought to seek peace between one another and get out of the state of war. Right? If others aren't doing their part, then you still may seek the advantages of war. But the first rule for Hobbes is that you should seek peace and follow it. 
And he says that this first rule of seeking peace leads us to the second law of nature for Hobbes, that when others are seeking peace, uh, as for the peace and defense of himself, he shall think it necessary to lay down his right to all things. So to leave the state of nature, we say, you know what? I will no longer entitle myself to do whatever I want in any way I can uh, to look after myself. I'm going to be contented with a little less liberty. How much liberty? Well, he says, uh, with so much liberty against other men as he would allow other men against himself. So insofar as it's scary for me, it's insecure for me when others are acting at complete liberty, I'm going to figure out an amount of liberty that's going to be safe for all of us to act on, right? So this is Hobbes' second law of nature, give up your right to all things. So for Hobbes, justice emerges once we've given up to our, our right to all things, right? At that point, we've basically made a contract. He says, for where no covenant hath proceeded, there hath no right been transferred, and every man has right to everything, and consequently no action can be unjust. Right? Everything is legal in the state of nature. But, he says, when a covenant is made, then to break it is unjust and the definition of injustice. Because, remember, uh, covenants are these voluntary uh, agreements to do something for someone else. And it involves laying down your right to do whatever you feel like doing, and in a way where the state, as Hobbes puts it, the commonwealth, is enforcing this requirement uh, to perform your action. So he says that once you break a genuine covenant, that is uh, unjust. And the definition of injustice is no other than the non-performance of your covenants. And then he says, as long as you're following all your covenants, you are just, right? Because the rules of justice just say, don't break these voluntary agreements that you've made and which are being enforced uh, by sufficient coercive power. Now, it's interesting to note that for Hobbes, pursuing self-interest is not the same thing as being selfish, right? Fraud and force, lying and cheating and stealing are what selfishness connotes for us, right? That's what we think about when we think about selfishness. Uh, so Hobbes points out that whenever a man tran transferreth his right or renounceth it, it is either in consideration of some right reciprocally transferred to himself or for some other good he hopeth for thereby. So he's saying, we decide not to be selfish when we leave the state of nature. But he goes on to say that uh, leaving the state of nature, renouncing your right to all things, is a voluntary act. And he says, of the voluntary acts of every man, the object is some good to himself. So you might remember a concept from earlier in this book, Living Ethics, of psychological egoism. That's the view that everything people intentionally do, they're doing to intentionally make themselves better off. Well, Hobbes, as we can see, is a psychological egoist. Hobbes basically thinks it doesn't make sense to claim that a person is doing something 
but doing something that they don't believe is going to bring some good to themselves. But within this context, Hobbes is saying that one way that we bring a good to ourselves is by renouncing certain rights in order to have those rights recipro reciprocally transferred back to ourselves. Um, and in this way, Hobbes is suggesting that pursuing your self-interest in a rational way might be quite a different thing from being selfish, the sort of person who lies, cheats, and steals. So I hear a lot of people say, a lot of the time, that Hobbes thinks everybody is selfish. Well, if you mean self-interested, just looking out for themselves, that's true. But it doesn't mean that you can't trust people's words or that they're always going to stab you in the back at the least provocation. Because self-interest says, actually, being cooperative is the thing that's in your most self-interest, because we want to get out of the state of nature. It's in our self-interest to live in a place where life is not nasty, brutish, and short, where you don't fear death uh, at the hands of others competing for scarce resources. Now, Hobbes is basically painting a social contract theory of justice. He says, we engage in and follow the rules of justice in order to live peaceably, to have happier lives. Now, some people sometimes say, well, you know what we should do is live in a society where we have the rules of justice, but then break those rules when it's convenient. It's basically saying, rules of justice, let's just don't and say that we did, and if we can get away with it, great. We get all the benefits of a peaceful society, but we don't actually have to do the work. Well, here's what Hobbes says about that line of thinking. He says, the fool hath said in his heart that there is no such thing as justice, and sometimes also with his tongue, seriously alleging that every man's conservation and contentment being committed to his own care that there could be no reason why every man might not do what he thought conduced thereunto, and therefore also to make or not make, keep or not keep, covenants was not against reason when it conduced to one's benefit. So how does Hobbes come back at this line of thinking? Because right now he's just sketching this line of thought. He's not endorsing it. Well, Hobbes says, when a man doth a thing, which notwithstanding anything can be foreseen and reckoned, on tendeth to his own destruction, however some accident, which he could not expect, arriving may turn it to his benefit. So basically Hobbes is saying, yeah, you might try to steal in order to free ride on the benefits of justice, those rules that everybody else is following and you're benefiting from, but you're trying to also benefit from the breach of these rules. Well, Hobbes points out that cheating the rules of justice has a big risk to it when our covenants are real valid covenants, right? And that means that there's going to be an enforcer and that enforcer could kill you, right? Now, there may be cases where you were trying to steal something, you were trying to steal a pile of money or a car for your own enjoyment. Well, if you're depending on accidents which you can't expect, and those accidents might or might not come to be, right? What if there was an accident that doesn't turn out in your way, right? then it would say, if you're taking that kind of risk, it's not reasonable or wise to cheat the rules of justice. He continues and says, he therefore that breaketh his covenant, 
Uh, he's basically consequently declaring that he thinks he may with reason do so. But somebody who thinks that cannot be received into any society that unite themselves for peace and defense, but by the error of them that receive him. So he's suggesting that we cannot uh, become a member of society in a genuine way if we are continually trying to cheat people, right? We have to do this through lying and deceit. So he says it's by the errors of other men, which he could not foresee or reckon upon, and consequently it's against reason and of preservation. Uh, and so, as all men that contribute not to his destruction forbear him only out of ignorance of what is good for themselves. So you are acting out of ignorance of what's truly good for you uh, when you try to cheat the rule of justice. And remember, the rule of justice is just those voluntary agreements that we lay down to escape the state of nature. So those are the six things you need to know about uh, Hobbes in the Leviathan, uh, or at least the most famous passages of this uh, well-known classic text in moral and political philosophy. So just to recap really fast, in the state of nature, nothing is unjust and everything is legal, and that's horrible. Two. Hobbes thinks it's foolish to act cooperatively with others if you have no reason to think that they too are going to cooperate. We don't want to be made suckers. We don't want to be exploited. Three, Hobbes thinks that we possess a capacity for reason, and that's going to lead us to give up our right to all things and to keep our contracts, right? Just so long as we think that we can get others to lay down their right thing, their right to all things as well. So there's no justice or injustice in the state of nature, but once we leave the state of nature and have contracts, then there is justice. So justice for Hobbes is all about keeping your contracts, following through on the covenants that you make. Now, for Hobbes, pursuing self-interest, which Hobbes says people are doing all the time, no matter what they do, as long as they're acting voluntarily, they are aiming at some good to themselves. But that's not the same thing as being selfish, being the sort of person who is inclined to lie, cheat, and steal. And then the last point that Hobbes gives us is that it would be foolish to try to cheat the rules of justice. So once you make a commitment to not have a right to all things, to live in society, to have property rights, uh, to not have others uh, invade your property or kill you, well, you're not gonna try to get away with that either, right? because you're depending on the ignorance and errors of others in order to uh, gain these secret benefits. So those are the six things that I think that you should know about Hobbes and the Leviathan. So thanks for listening in.